Good evening and welcome to the NLO, the Norman Lockyer Observatory. We're very happy to support uh, Natural Devon for Devon Dark Skies Week in their support of preserving our wonderful dark skies we have here um, on the East Devon coast. So tonight we're going to start with a, a virtual planetarium tour using um, the software in front of me, which is called Stellarium. We're going to give you a tour of the night sky and then all being well, we'll show you some uh, objects that we can see through our telescopes tonight. The reason why we've chosen tonight is because you'll see a nice grouping of the moon and the giant gas giant Saturn and Jupiter in the southwestern sky soon after dark. The piece of software I'm demonstrating is called Stellarium. Now this is freeware, you can download it if you go to stellarium.org and upload it in your computers and it's the best way of showing you around the night sky and what is visible. So tonight we have the three a group of the moon and two planets in the southwest and we've got Mars uh, rising high now in the southeast. It's just past opposition so it's best for viewing uh, at the present moment in time and we've got the Milky Way over there in the uh, southwest. But to start with I'll start with a little introduction uh, of the wonderful observatory here in East Devon the Norman Lockyer Observatory. Its history goes back a hundred years. It was established by Sir Norman Lockyer uh, when he retired as director of the Solar Physics Observatory in Kensington. Um, his friends persuaded him to build a new observatory opposite Stalkham Hill above Sidmouth. One of the reasons why you moved was uh, the Solar Physics Observatory in central London was uh, having problems with uh, light, increasing light pollution from the city and a lot of smog. So the Solar Physics Observatory moved to uh, Cambridge and Lockyer retired down here and his good friends Frank McLean and his wife provided funds for setting up uh, the new observatory. In the picture here you'll see the two domes of Kensington and the Maclean Dome and the picture here is a fine Victorian telescope, this is the Kensington telescope, still in regular use at the NLO. Of course the site uh, after Lockyer died and his son James died it remained in private hands until the 1960s. Uh, when Exeter University took it over. At that stage, they didn't have uh, an astronomy department. Uh, and so it was proposed to sell the site in the 1980s. The good people in Sidmouth, uh, led by Sir Patrick Moore, saved the observatory for posterity. Funds were raised. East Devon District Council bought the site. They're now the current owners and the Norman Lockyer Observatory Society manage it on their behalf. This bird's eye view of uh, the observatory shows the Kensington Dome in the far west, the Mon Dome which houses uh, Lockyer's famous six and a quarter inch refractor that discovered helium on the sun. Off screen to the right we have the McLean telescope, Victoria Dome and the new Connell Dome. Also since this picture was taken we've built, built a new extension, the Helen Jane Bregani extension um, on uh, the north side of the building. So tonight had you been uh, able to come to the observatory we'd have been in this building here. This is our planetarium, the James Lockyer Planetarium and it houses a wonderful 1960s planetarium projector. Inside this dark ball is a bright arc light. 
that projects a light through tiny little holes in the sphere and they generate star pictures on the ceiling. Here's a constellation of Orion rising in the southeastern sky. But tonight, of course, we, sadly we can't be there. We will show you a virtual planetarium show uh, using Stellarium. But afterwards, we also hope you to show you some live images taken uh, from our telescopes in our backyards. I'll be using this telescope here, a nine inch Celestron with a little camera attached, which will be feeding uh, images to the computer outside, which will link to my computer here in my study. John McLean will also be sending us pictures from Exeter University. And, and so will um, Alan from also uh, the edge of Dartmoor. These are the pictures we hope to show you later. These were taken um, earlier this year. Is the uh, giant gas giant Saturn with its beautiful rings. We've got Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system with its great red spot and little Mars. Mars is now a little bigger than it was uh, when this was taken in August. The uh, polar cap has melted a bit, but it should be almost twice the size of that if we succeed in seeing it tonight. So what I propose to do now is we're going to switch uh, to uh, Stellarium uh, software on my computer. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen. And I'm going to share Stellarium. Okay, so the sky is set up for uh, tonight at 8.30. I said before we have a nice little grouping of the planets in the southwestern sky. I'm going to click on the moon and center it in our field of view. And what I can do uh, up here, where you can see the, uh, it's generated a little data sheet on how old the moon is. So it's seven days past, nearly eight days past new moon. It's called a waxing gibbous. So that means the gibbous phase is getting bigger and it's waxing means it's, uh, it's enlarging. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit using my mouse and you'll see it's at what we call the first quarter stage. I'll go into a little bit more detail about the actual features you can see. But the moon at first quarter is probably the best time for anybody starting out to look at the moon because the shadows, we call this the terminator, this is the difference between the day side and the night side of the moon. The shadows are at their longest on the terminator, so we can see craters in more detail. When the moon is completely full, of course, there's no shadows, so it's harder to, de to detect um, these craters. Uh, what we can also see is the large dark seas. These were called seas by the ancients. Um, they were all given their names. This is the Sea of Serenity, Mari Serenitatis, by Riccioli, the Italian astronomer, about 400 years ago. So we have the Sea of Serenity, the Sea of Tranquility. This is where Apollo 11 landed back in 1969. We've got uh, the Sea of Crises, the Sea of Fecundity and the Sea of Nectar. Right, let's leave the moon for the time being and go and visit uh, the two little companion bright lights in the sky. If I click on Jupiter and we center that, we can pick up some basic facts about Jupiter um, as I zoom in. Now, just with a pair of binoculars, what you will pick up are four little moons, two either side, Ganymede, Europa, Io and Callisto. These are fascinating worlds in their own right. Ganymede is one of the largest satellites in the solar system. Europa is a very intriguing little world. There's probably more water on Europa than there is on planet Earth. Europa is covered by a 15 mile thick 
uh, solid ice surface and below that we believe there may well be liquid water which holds the possibility of there being life in the seas in Europa. Little moon on the other side of Jupiter is a little moon called Io. That's a highly volcanic moon, the most volcanic body in the whole, system, whole solar system, and they're believed to be about three or four hundred active volcanoes on Io. The reason why Io is so volcanic is because it is so near Jupiter, the tidal forces of Jupiter bend and buckle the surface, um, the tidal forces raise as lowers um, Io's surface by about 100 meters twice a day. So you can imagine all that tidal heating keeps the interior very molten. If we zoom in a bit clearer, closer, we can see Jupiter is a gas giant. We call it a gas giant because you can't actually see the surface. What you're looking at is the dark bands and the lighter zones and this is all rotating very quickly. Jupiter is, is a giant planet with equatorial diameter 143,000 kilometers. It spins around its axis in just nine hours 55 minutes. Well worth having a look at with a telescope. Unfortunately it's very low in the sky this time of the year so uh, the seeing in, in Jupiter is very limited uh, by our atmosphere. Next we click on Saturn. Now, Saturn is a showpiece in any telescope. Um, if I zoom in you can see its beautiful ring system. It's another gas giant with this beautiful ring and we, with our telescopes we can probably detect a black gap in the ring. This is called the Cassini division discovered by uh, the Italian astronomer Cassini uh, about 400 years ago. Again, it's a gaseous globe, rather like Jupiter, but not so deeply colored. Saturn also has many moons, probably as many as 80. Uh, we can identify about four, five bright moons with our little telescope. Right, I'm now going to swing the sky around to the southeast, and here we can see planet Mars. A planet Mars um, is, you can see it, it bears down on us like a big bright red torch in the sky, a really bright light. Now Mars is red because literally the surface has rusted. Um, it did have an atmosphere at one stage. It had a lot of water. A lot of the oxygen has gone to oxidize the surface and just like uh, iron when it uh, oxidizes goes a red rusty color, so the surface of Mars has also gone a red rusty color. Through our telescopes we can see these dark markings. The ancients believed these were seas. We now know that's not true. These are uh, darker regions on the moon are more mountainous regions, probably higher than the red sandy deserts. Mars is also accompanied by two little tiny moons, Phobos and Deimos. These are probably far too faint for us to see visually, but we can pick those up uh, with our cameras. So much for the planets. We've also got Uranus and Neptune up there as well, uh, but uh, they're rather too faint for us to see any detail through our telescopes. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to swing round to the North Star, to the northern, northern sky, and we're going to look for a familiar object uh, that hopefully we can all identify, because this will be our signpost for guiding us around the sky. Have a look to the north and you'll see a little assembly of seven stars making up what we affectionately known as the plough or the Big Dipper. I can make life a little bit easier and I can join up the dots and you can see the extent of the plough. It's really, its proper name is Ursa Major, the Great Bear. 
and it's composed this area here we call the bowl of the dipper is the body of the pair this is its head this is its front feet and these are its back feet i make it even simpler if i press this button and you can see all the uh, wonderful uh, constellation figures as they were believed to be by the ancients so here we have great bear ursa major interestingly enough the great bear appears in both eastern and western cultures so it's something very common it must be a very old constellation for these stars to be re represented by both the east and the west uh, i'm going to turn off the constellation lines because it gets a bit complicated and use the plow we now know where the plow is and use that to find our way around the sky to start with a very useful arrow is to use the two n stars of the bowl of the plow these are called the pointers the stars merak and juve and they will point to a solitary star in the sky which is polaris and polaris represents an extension of the earth's axis in space and if i press play you'll see what happens the stars, as the Earth rotates, and look at the clock going around, the stars are wheeling around that solitary star. That's Polaris, our North Star. I'm going to stop it there and send it back. So you can see that Polaris is our North Star, simply an extension in space of the Earth's axis. If you were standing at the North Pole, this star would be high overhead. If you are at the equator, this star will be right down on your northern horizon. And if you were down in New Australia, New Zealand, you wouldn't be able to see Polaris because it would be below your horizon. Let's now uh, take a line straight through Polaris and we come to a W in the sky. This is the vain queen Cassiopeia. I'll put the constellation figures up. And you can see how vain she is. She's sitting on her throne, looking at her face in a little hand mirror. Sitting alongside him is the king Zephyrus in his chair. And if I now turn those figures off and turn the constellations off, you'll see they're in a little misty patch of light here which is uh, effectively our Milky Way. And I'm going to turn, make the Milky Way a little bit brighter. And I'm going to swing back around to the southern sky. And here we can see the Milky Way. You need to be in a dark sky site, ideally on Dartmoor or Exmoor, to see the Milky Way in all its glory. The Milky Way is a giant Catherine wheel of stars um, out there in space. All the stars that we can see in the sky belong to the Milky Way and we're all rotating around it in 250 million years. Patrick Moore described the Milky Way as if you laid two fried eggs back to back. The yolk of the egg, the densest part, or we call the core of the Milky Way, is down here in Sagittarius. And then you have the disc, that be the white of the eggs. The disc of the Milky Way is the, the spiral arms that extend out for 100,000 light years um, across the expanse. You also got this dark, dusty material. This would be the gap between the two fried eggs. And um, this dark, dusty material um, is obscuring matter that's actually preventing the starlight from shining behind it. All the stars are produced from these giant molecular clouds, these dark clouds. Gravity pulls this material together. As it does so, it heats up and new stars are created. So that's the Milky Way. Let's have a look at 
three bright stars now straddling the Milky Way. This star at the bottom, this star uh, christened the Summer Triangle by Patrick Moore. Let's click on Altair. This is a bright star, uh, but it's not that far away. It's 16 light years. So the light you see from Altair at the moment, if you go and have a look at it, has taken 16 years to reach your eye. Now that is relatively near in terms of uh, stellar distances. The nearest star to the Earth is Alpha Centauri at about four and a quarter light years. Let's have a look at another star in the triangle. This is Vega. Um, this is uh, slightly brighter than, than Altair. But this is, as you can see, it is about 25 uh, light years away. And the other star is Deneb. Now Deneb is uh, a celestial searchlight. This is about 1500 light years away, um, but it's a lot brighter than Vega. And the reason why it appears the same apparent brightness it's because it is so much further away. So these stars make up the Summer Triangle and they border across the Milky Way. There's a lovely story, a Chinese tale, about the star Altair and Vega. Vega was the weaver girl and Altair was the shepherd boy. And these two uh, the boy and the girl fell very much in love, but their relationship was banned by the gods. As punishment, they were put either side of the celestial river. However, on the seventh day of the seventh night, a uh, flock of magpies form a bridge of birds and the two lovers meet. However, if that night is stormy and rainy, the birds can't make a bridge and the pair have to wait another year. <coughs> Let's have a closer look. If I click on Vega and we center it, we'll see that Vega is a little constellation called the Lyre, a little triangular grouping of, uh, sorry, a parallelogram grouping of stars. Now, the other thing I can do is click the button there for deep sky objects. Now in between these two stars, if you have a telescope, be sure to have a, this little object here, it's the ring nebula. If I click on it and center it, and we zoom in with our telescopes, what you will see is a little tiny ring of light. It will look like a little smoke ring in your telescope. Probably won't be as big as that, it will be around about that size, but you can certainly differentiate it between a, a star. Now with our uh, telescopes and electronic cameras, we get a beautiful color appears in this object. We have the glowing red from the hydrogen alpha light and the blue from ionized oxygen. Now what you're seeing here is an exploded star. This is how we believe our sun will end up in about 5,000 billion years. The sun is about halfway through its life. By about another 5,000 billion years, it will puff out its outer atmosphere as it used up its storage of, of hydrogen and it will explode and leave a little white dwarf star in the center. Of course, at that stage, all life will sadly be extinguished on the earth. So don't worry, we've got a long time until that happens. So this little ring nebula will expand in space and all this material will be recycled and form into new stars. It's a long way away. We can see the distance here is about 2,800 light years. So you're seeing light as it was 2,800 years ago to reach your eye. So that's the first deep sky object. The next object I wanted to point out before it sets 
is the great star cluster in Hercules. Let me point out where Hercules is. Hercules, of course, was the Greek hero. On the old star charts, he's shown here upside down. Here are his legs. And this little box here we call the keystone. If you imagine the keystone um, being the central stone and a bridge. I'm going to click on this object here, the great star cluster in Hercules. And we're going to zoom in and see what this looks like. You can see this object with a pair of binoculars as a fuzzy star. But as we zoom in with our telescope, we'll see what it is in its true glory. A beautiful assembly of stars, as many as 500,000 stars in a beautiful snowball of stars. This is gravity holding these stars in a really tightly knit snowball. If you were, our sun was in one of these, the night sky would be glorious. It would be so bright, there probably wouldn't be any, any daylight. This object's a long way away. It's 25,000 light years away. So um, we believe there are a lot of these objects, about two or 300 of these globular star clusters that swarm around the galactic core of our Milky Way. So they're not intrinsically part of the Milky Way, but they're gravitationally bound by it, and they swarm around rather like bees around a honeypot. A beautiful object to look at through um, a telescope, uh, and it's well worth, it's a celestial lollipop for those who have telescopes. Right, what we're gonna do now is we're going to swing around to the south. And I'm going to point out a big square of stars. This is the square of Pegasus. I'll just show what he looks like on the ancients, what the ancients thought of him. Pegasus, of course, is the winged horse. And he's shown here flying upside down with his legs up here, his head over here. We've got another globular star cluster, the Pegasus cluster, just off his nose. What I want to focus on is a little chain of stars coming off the left uppermost star of Pegasus. This is actually the constellation of Andromeda, the beautiful princess of the, the Queen Cassiopeia and King Zephyrus. Um, we'll turn off the constellation figures and we're going to click on the object here and you'll see I've highlighted it is the Andromeda galaxy. Now this object is the furthest object you can see with the naked eye. If I zoom in with a telescope or a pair of binoculars, with a pair of binoculars you'll see it as a misty elongated patch of light. Now a good way of finding this is find yourself at the top of the square of Pegasus, this is a star Alpha Rats, jump two stars to the left along Andromeda, to Mirac, two stars up at right angles, and you will find Andromeda galaxy. Now, for the pair of binoculars, it will look like a fuzzy elongated patch. If you've got a nice dark sky, you can actually see this with your naked eye. The furthest object you could see with the naked eye, and it lies about two and a quarter million light years away. If we zoom in with our telescopes, you'll see it in all its glory. Well, I shouldn't say that. When you look at it through a telescope, it's rather disappointing because you'll just see the bright galactic core and it really won't be very exciting. But if you image it through your telescope with a DSLR camera or a, a purpose-built, what we call a CCD camera, you'll see Andromeda in all its glory. Andromeda is rather like the Milky Way. It's probably 25% bigger. So it's about 125,000 light years across from end to end, composed of a central core of old uh, reddish stars and these spiral arms, you can see the dust lanes. And on the dust lanes, you have blue stars. Now the color of a star basically tells us this temperature and hence how old it is. Blue stars are hot and they're generally very young. 
as they use up their supply of hydrogen, they cool and become red giant stars, like the stars in the center of Andromeda. But Andromeda also has two little companion galaxies, Messier 32 and Messier 110. These M numbers uh, represent the French astronomer Charles Messier, who was a comet hunter, but he's more renowned for all the fuzzy patches in the sky he discovered, which he catalogued because he didn't want to confuse himself with these patches uh, as being comets. So he made a catalog of them, but he's more renowned for his Messier object of catalogues of fuzzy objects than he is for the comets that he discovered. So let's now go down the, I'm going a little bit further, explore down the Milky Way, and we come to our gallant Hercius Perseus, and below him are the charioteer Riga. But before, <clears throat> below him, I want to point out this grouping of stars here. This is the famous constellation of Taurus the bull. Um, the face of the bull is an open cluster of stars called the Hyades, uh, with a red giant star called Aldebaran. This is easily uh, visible to the naked eye as a, a red color. You will be able to see that, representing the red eye of the bull. If you extend the lines of the V's of his face, you'll come to the tips of his horn. If I put the constellation figures on, you'll see here the whole face and the tips of Taurus's horns. He has very elongated horns. Now, the other point, object I want to point out is this little object here. Let's remove the figures. And center this. This object here is the famous Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. <clears throat> a beautiful object to look at through a pair of binoculars. In fact, a pair of binoculars is the best uh, viewer you can have for this cluster because it's quite a large object. If you look in a telescope, you probably only see one or two stars. But through a pair of binoculars, it shows a beautiful cluster of hot blue stars. Long exposure photographs show this beautiful nebula in which it's enveloped in. It's uh, these gaseous clouds, uh, which is believed to be a gas cloud that the star cluster is currently moving through. Had you been a dinosaur walking on the Earth's surface uh, 60 million years ago, these stars wouldn't have formed. So in the terms of history of the universe, this is a very young star cluster. Let's now go back to the tip of the horn of the bull, just north of a star called Kangwan. And click on a click on this, the Crab Nebula. And why this is important, because this shows an object a star that's reached the end of its life. We saw the Ring Nebula, which is a star the size of the sun that has ended its life as a white dwarf and just puffed out its outer atmosphere. This is a more dramatic ending of a star's life. It reps a supernova explosion. That is when a star blows itself to bits, so it represents a giant star. Now, if we zoom in, we can see what it is. A little misty patch of light, but you can see these tendrils of this explosion happening. This star exploded in the year 1054, and the Chinese record it um, in their, in their um, catalogues as a guest star. It appeared, and it was so bright, they could see it for three months in a daylight sky. So it was a it's what we call now a supernova explosion. The Chinese saw the guest star. And it's, of course, it has 
Brighton it has it has uh, uh, exploded since then, so it, it's lost its brightness. But what is left is a tiny little uh, densely spinning neutron star, uh, which is causing these filaments, uh, the explosion, to light up. This star, of course, is still exploding. It, it sent, exploded. Uh, and all these tendrils are a result of that explosion. When a big star goes supernova, in fact, it also implodes. It compresses uh, material right in its core, and that is called a neutron star. So dense that one teaspoon of this would probably weigh about a billion tons. It's also spinning very rapidly. This star is spinning around 30 times a second, and we call that star, sending out a radio wave, we call that star a pulsar, a pulsating radio star. So an intriguing object, the Crab Nebula, which represents the end of a massive star uh, of its life. Right. <coughs> I'm now going to... Speed on the sky a bit. And we see our good friend Orion rising in the sky. We we'll let him get a bit higher. So Orion is, of course, the uh, in Roman mythology, he is the hunter. And here you can see him with his shield, uh, or some depicting with his bow and arrow, or his, and here he, in his hand, he's got his club, holding a club, and he's about to strike the charging bull. These three stars here make up the three stars of Orion's belt. And hanging down from a belt, you have this wonderful sword. If I now zoom in on the central star in his sword, and the center of that, you can see it's a big bubble of glowing gas. This is the Great Iran Nebula. You can just about make this out with the naked eye. You can certainly see it with a pair of binoculars, but a telescope does its justice. What you're looking at here is a giant gaseous cloud, a big bubble that is being illuminated by three little, four little stars in the center called the trapezium. This bubble of gas is about 1,343 light years away. Uh, we can see it because uh, these are young stars. They're illuminating this. Um, and we can see this giant structure. If I go a little bit to the north, we can see Iran is full of a lot of deep sky objects. This is the end star with the three stars of Iran's belt. Here we see the wonderful Horsehead Nebula. You won't see this visually through a telescope, but you can image this with a DSLR uh, camera on a telescope and the wonderful flame nebula. <coughs> the dark nebula here, the horse head, represents dark obscuring matter, uh, stopping the light from this gaseous cloud emission nebula uh, being seen from behind it. I'm going to wind the sky on a bit further. And we can use three stars of Iran's belt to point us in several directions. If we go to the north, we can use the belt stars of Iran to point to Taurus 
and the Pleiades, seven sisters. If we go the other way, it will point to the brightest star in the sky. This is Sirius. Our brightest star that we can see, um, and Sirius is about nine light years away. It represents <clears throat> the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major. And this was a very important star for the ancient Egyptians. When they saw Sirius rising just before dawn in the July sky, twinkling in the blue sky, they knew that was a, a signal that the Nile was shortly going to flood and mark the start of their growing season. Hence, what we call the heliacal rising of Sirius marked the start of the Egyptian calendar. If we swing round to the east now, we see a notable question mark rising in the sky. This is Leo, the lion, and He's marked by the bright star Regulus that marks the, the heart of the lion. Regulus always regarded by a regal star by the ancient Chinese. If I zoom out now, you can see that our old friend the plough has now left the northern horizon is now rising up in the north east, now northeast. And you see what the time is. It's now 3.20 tomorrow morning. So time's pressing on and I'm going to wind the sky on a little bit further. And you'll see another planet is rising. This of course is planet Venus. If we center that, and if we zoom in, and of course Venus is the brightest planet in the sky. It's uh, Earth's nearest planet, it's an inferior planet, therefore it's inside Earth's orbit. And if I carry on zooming in, you'll see it appears as a little gibbous phase. So we can't quite see it as a circle. It's a gibbous phase, phase. But also, of course, notice we can't see any surface features. Venus has a very dense atmosphere of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. So it's a very inhospitable atmosphere. We can't see the surface features. You might have heard recently on the news that they might have detected a gas called phosphine in the atmosphere that may well be a precursor and signify there is life existing in the clouds about 50, 60 kilometers above the surface. But we know the actual surface of Venus will be very hostile, very acidic, and very hot, it has a surface temperature about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm now going to zoom out a bit. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to speed up the sky. And you'll notice some objects flying around. These are called satellites in our sky at the moment. And in particular, I'm going to hopefully spot one really bright one that's going to arise any minute. I'm going to, here we are, whoops, stop it. It's very bright light here, if I click on that, this is the International Space Station. It actually will be passing if you're up tomorrow morning at 6.40, you'll see the International Space Station pass very close to Venus. The other thing to look out for is Coming up above it, just appearing now, you'll see a little satellite. Um, 
In fact, they'll be followed by a whole stream of them. These are the Starlink chain of satellites that Elon Musk has launched. Um, here they come in now, a train of them. There's many about 30 or 40 in a straight line. So a lot of astronomers are very concerned about these Starlink satellites. There's going to be as many tens of thousands up there in the sky. Um, and they're certainly going to affect all our astrophotographs. They're going to be ruined by many of these uh, arrays of satellites in the sky. And here comes a few more of them. See how prolific they are. So we're going to speed up the sky. And a little while later, the sun is going to rise. And dawn breaks. And it's surprising for how long we can actually see Venus in a brightening sky. But of course, when the sun gets above the horizon, you lose all the planets and the stars, and another day has dawned. So I will finish the planetarium show there now. We're going to stop sharing. And I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint show. And we hope to uh, do some live imaging through our telescopes. So I'll be using um, this telescope, which is a nine inch Celestron telescope. As I mentioned, we have a little camera, at the eyepiece end, and that's connected to a computer here. Uh, and I said, we would hope to show you, um, these are pictures I took earlier this year through this telescope. So unfortunately, the sky is clouded, so I'm unable to show you uh, live views. But what we can do, we can show you typical views um, that we get of the planets. So first up, I've got a picture of Mars that was taken earlier this evening. Now, one of the problems of using telescopes on the Earth, of course, is you're looking at Earth through Earth's atmosphere. So if we're looking at these very small objects, they get uh, degraded by the atmospheric turbulence in our sky. Just as you look out across uh, on a hot summer's day on a hot sandy beach, you'll see low down in the horizon, the air will appear very turbulent and your view will be distorted. So it is when you're looking uh, through the sky. Um, so this little video clip, uh, probably about 200 times showing the planet Mars as it was earlier. So what you can see you know, is unfortunately if the wind blows, it will blow us off target, but hopefully it will right itself again. Um, what this will show is you can just say, make out a little white polar cap here, and you can see some dark markings. And what we can do to improve this image is take a little video clip uh, of about 30 seconds. And we take, uh, these are very sensitive cameras, so they will be operating about one tenth of a second um, uh, each picture they take. So we'll get about three or four thousand frames and we can stack the image together with special software. Uh, we can get an image like this that was generated from this fuzzy picture. 
So here we can see Mars in a little bit more detail. We've accentuated the colors. We've got the red sandy deserts. We've got a nice polar cap. This is the South Polar Cap. Um, the telescope actually inverts um, uh, an image. So we've got south at the top. <coughs> we've got uh, the North Polar Cap here, which is actually hidden by these bluish clouds. And we've also got blue clouds on the morning uh, horizon. This feature here, the ancients called the Eye of Mars. <coughs> it rather looks like a, a dark, uh, pupil set in its eye socket. The feature here is the famous Mariner Valley. This is a huge structure, a big uh, ravine, uh, two and a half thousand miles long. So this is a lot bigger than the Grand Canyon in America. This would stretch right across the United States. Down here, we've got uh, one of the seas, Mount Acidalium. This is where uh, the Viking landers landed in 1976. And also, if you've seen uh, the movie Martian, uh, Matt Damon would have been marooned on this sea here before he was rescued. So Mars, as you can see, it's a difficult object to observe. It doesn't get that very big, but it's a fascinating object. And it, of course, fascinated the Victorian astronomers who believed that they could see uh, uh, canals on Mars. Of course, we knew that wasn't the case when uh, Mariner 4 and Mariner 9 took high resolution pictures of it in the 1960s. But we're still intrigued to find we know there is water on Mars. We know there's uh, masses of water, certainly near the North South Pole. And if there is water, there's a greater chance of, of there being life on Mars. So watch this space for the life on Mars story. That last picture was taken with a little color camera. <clears throat> we can tend to get a better picture of Mars if we're using a mono camera, but we use three filters, red, green, and blue. And we can stack these uh, three frames together and make a color picture. <coughs> in this instance, I'm using a, an infrared pass filter. So this is a longer wavelength than a normal uh, red light. And that is less susceptible to what we've just seen, the wobbly seeing conditions. And so here's another picture of Mars. This little white speck here is the giant volcano Olympus Mons. We're with our ground-based telescopes, you can see giant volcanoes on Mars. Olympus Mons is about three times the height of Mount Everest. And sometimes it has little white clouds forming around its, its crater rim. Here's another picture, another <coughs> red, green, and blue image of Mars taken a few nights ago, again of the famous eye on Mars. Jupiter, I haven't had so much success with uh, Jupiter. Um, it's very low down this year, but this is the best I've got. We can see the great red spot on Jupiter, this big red storm, and the dark belts and the lighter zones. And of course, Saturn with its beautiful rings. This was taken a month ago, 20th of September, from our backyard here. We can see uh, the darker outer ring, the brighter inner ring, and the dark Cassini division separating the two. And of course, Saturn is another gas giant about 750 million miles away. On to the moon. The moon, of course, just with the naked eye, you can see these dark features known as the lunar Mary. The ones on view tonight is the Sea of Serenity, Maris Serenitatis, the Sea of Tranquility, the Sea of Fecundity, and the Sea of Nectar, and the Mary Chrysium. People often ask me what's the smallest object I could see with my telescopes. Well, we can use uh, like a Barlow lens on our imaging devices, 
Um, so we can increase the magnification that we've seen when we were imaging Mars. Picture on the left would have been taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter from a height about 50 kilometers above the lunar surface. So you can see lots of detail um, in this crater Tycho. Tycho is the crater, you can see with a pair of binoculars with a wonderful ray system that radiate out, out from it during full moon. It has a central mountainous peak here and a ramparted edge. This telescope, this image here was taken through the nine inch telescope. You can see it's foreshortened. We weren't flying over the top of it. We were seeing it from angle, so it appears squashed. We can also see uh, detail on the ramparts of Tycho. But this little rock here, that's imaged here, which I've arrowed, is a little rock, uh, probably about one and a half kilometers in size. So the smallest object we could see with our telescopes would be about a kilometer in size. We couldn't see a, an astronaut standing on the moon, but we could see something a little bit larger than a football pitch had there been astronauts playing football on the moon. So this is the moon, the phases as it was uh, tonight. And here's a wonderful sea of uh, serenity. Uh, and these dark wrinkle ridges is the Dorsa Smirnov, uh, which formed when this big impact happened soon after the moon formed. It was a, literally a lake of molten lava, magma. As it cooled, it cracked and it formed this little uh, rill. This is the southern part of the moon what we call the Southern Uplands. And what I'd like to point out to this evening is um, a little formation here. It looks rather like a rabbit's head with its ears and a big crater here with lots of little other craters formed on its ring. The large crater here is the crater Janssen. He was a French astronomer who shared the discovery of hydrogen on the sun with um, our founder, Norman Lockyer, who's rewarded with a little crater here. Oops, where is it now? This is uh, Lockyer Crater. Imagine it's the nose of this rabbit with his two ears. So at that point, um, I will end our little introduction to the night sky. I hope you've enjoyed this evening and I've whetted your appetite uh, to go out there and have a look at the night sky. And I do hope before long you all get a chance to come and visit us at the NLO. Good night for now. Bye.